Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us. My name is Richard Wabikin, and I am the Associate Dean for Business and Government Relations and Senior Economist at the University of Colorado Boulder Lead School of Business. Welcome back to our fifth and final day of the 56th Annual Business Economic Outlook Forum. Each day this week, one of our lead centers of excellence is hosting a panel session on business and the economy. For today's session, we feature the Bird Center for Finance panel session entitled, The Fed, The Market, The Disconnect. A few housekeeping items before we begin. First, if you have any questions now or during the presentation that you would like to ask, please send your questions through the Q&A interface. We will monitor these questions as they are submitted and the panel will respond to them throughout the presentation. As a reminder, for optimum audio quality, we do have everyone on mute except for our speakers. If you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, please notify us through the chat interface and one of our support specialists will touch base. Lastly, a link to access the recording will be sent to all registrants next week, along with a survey link and supplemental resources from today's presentation. Before we jump into the session, I'd like to recap a few points from the Business Economic Outlook Forum delivered on Monday that relates specifically to the finance area. Despite being in a pandemic-induced recession, the stock market has risen to record levels. The federal government has pumped unprecedented stimulus into the economy, and the Fed took historic measures to pump liquidity into the markets and support the financial system to avert another financial crisis. On the more state level, Colorado banks have remained on solid ground and were critical in assisting with the path to recovery, administering PPP loans. Colorado banks face many headwinds going into 2021, including the reaction of the economy to the pandemic, record low interest rates, troubled loans, and how PPP loans are dealt with. Regulatory reform, the increase in refinancing costs by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and the increased use of mobile banking and other technologies. Now I am excited to introduce today's moderator, David Gross, Senior Instructor and Associate Chair of the Finance Division at the Leeds School of Business. Welcome, Dave, and thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Rich. Uh, so I'm going to briefly introduce our panelists. Uh, first is uh, Nancy Davis. Nancy is the founder and managing partner and CIO of Quadratic Capital Management, where she manages the quadratic interest rate, uh, quadratic interest rate volatility and inflation hedge ETF. Uh, before that, she spent 10 years on a prop desk at Goldman Sachs, where she was head of credit, derivatives, and OTC trading. And after that, she managed a $500 million derivatives-only portfolio at Highbridge and was the director of derivatives at Alliance Bernstein. Uh, she publishes and is interviewed regularly in both the financial and popular press. Uh, welcome, Nancy. Uh, next is Gibson Smith. Gibson was the chief investment officer at Janus Capital Management, where he was the lead portfolio manager on all fixed income strategies. Uh, after his departure in, uh, in 2016, he launched his own firm, Smith Capital Investors, a fixed income boutique manager focusing on active total return fixed income management. Uh, Gibson serves on the Leeds School of Business Alumni and Friends Board, the Burridge Board, and the University of Colorado Treasury Advisory Board. Uh, welcome, Gibson. Ed Van Wessef is an Associate Professor of Finance here at the Leeds School. He earned his PhD in economics from Stanford University. Uh, his research interests cover a wide range of topics, including uh, the intersection of labor and finance, corporate governance, short sales, and shareholder voting. His current work is on the effect of biases in hiring, the effect of appraisals on asset prices, and the measure and measurements of academic uh, impact. Welcome, Ed. Hi, Dave. So, uh, what I want to start with very briefly is just a couple of slides to set the stage. And then I'll ask you, the audience, a couple of poll questions, and then we'll move to some questions for the panelists. So let me do the quick screen share. And I got to just bounce around and let's just make sure. How's that look? Does that look good? Great. OK, so here we're looking at GDP since 2019. And you can see the yellow recession band when this uh, the first quarter in which we had a recession. And then one down, here's the S&P 500 over that same time period, uh, again, with you know, roughly the same point in time. 
Uh, so we can see GDP bouncing up and down. We can see the market bouncing up and down. Of course, this is, wait for it, an average of stock prices. And so I think that might be something that's relevant. Uh, next, uh, I have the CAPE since 1880. I should have just been pulled this, but this is the quick one I found. This is the case, um, sorry, this is the cyclically adjusted price earnings ratio. And so this is a relative measure of stock value. And so you can see where we are at 3322. Uh, the cyclically adjusted price earnings ratio, just a relative measure of stock value. Whoops. Next, I have percent change in personal income. Now I'm doing percent change here uh, year over year. And you can see we move across one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different recession bands. And I think you can see that this is, well, maybe not unique, but some rare circumstances in this recession relative to other recessions. Uh, here's just that right hand corner. And I've gone back to levels from percent change, but you can see that this is disposable personal income just since 2019. We can compare that to those first two slides. And then finally, uh, credit card debt. And so I think these two sort of are interesting again since 2019. So what we're really talking about is the economy, the market, and there are obviously many, many factors. I've just chosen a couple for these slides, but that was, uh, that was sort of what I wanted to do to introduce this. Now, the next thing I want to do very quickly is go to a couple of polls. So I'm going to send out a poll now, and I'm going to ask the audience just a couple of questions. I'll give you about 30 seconds to answer these. Uh, and there's two questions. The first is, which of the following do you think is the biggest risk to the economy in the current year? And so please just answer, um, pick one. And uh, we'll see, oh, we're getting some answers. Another 10 seconds or so. So just give a quick answer. Okay, I'll give you five more seconds. And let's end the polling. And I can share the results. And there they are. And so we can see we have low interest rates in the flat yield curve, but it looks like equity valuation and inflated real asset values. All right, that's interesting. Good. Let me go to the second poll. I'm going to stop sharing these results. And I'm going to see if I can figure out how to get to the second poll. There it is. Okay, so uh, again, you can check more than one here. And the question is, are you in favor of more federal stimulus to any of the following? Uh, individuals, state and local governments, small businesses, big businesses, uh, universities, and obviously there are a uh, huge variety of small businesses and big businesses. Okay, we'll go another five, 10 seconds here. Second poll, people are the prime, so they answer quickly. And I'm gonna end, I'm gonna end the polling. And now we share the results and you can see that uh, big businesses uh, lose. Luckily, when we say small business, we mean small number of owners and not revenue size. Uh, well, that was a joke. Okay, uh, so, sorry, hold on a second. Uh, all right, good. Well, that's interesting results. Okay, uh, not enough of you selected universities, but uh, that, that's okay, I guess. Uh, Let's move on to the question. So now what I want to do is I just want to, again, uh, move to the, move to the, uh, where am I, to the panelist questions. And I guess we're going to start with this basic, basic question. Uh, is it the case that, that stocks are overvalued? Is there a disconnect between uh, the economy and, and the market? And I guess we can think about this in the context of, well, disposable income or maybe low interest rates, or uh, is it expected volatility that's driving this? And I guess we'll start with, uh, I guess we'll start with, uh, with Nancy. So, um... That's obviously the million dollar question is uh, the stock market is forward looking and right now the expectations are pretty rosy um, that the economy is going to recover because the vaccine is, you know, on the table or almost here. It's actually live in the UK and I think it's to be determined whether people are going to go back to normal economic behavior because obviously 
this shock has not been an economic shock. It's been a health shock. So I think the stock market is pricing in, look, you know, people will get back to normal. We will get through this. And it is a pretty optimistic time. I guess the contrarian side to that is whether it's right to be that way, whether people are going to you know, get vaccinated, whether we're going to develop herd immunity. And, and you could see the flip side where maybe people say, you know, no, I'm, I'm scared to get the vaccine or it hasn't been tested long enough. And maybe we go into the winter months in the Northern hemisphere and have, you know, more, uh, more cases, the hospitals, like all the same things that were there in March and April when equities were panicked and selling off still exist, right? It's still highly contagious. Um, we still don't have the vaccine in the mainstream. We could still have the hospitals overwhelmed. So it's it's a really um, difficult time for investors. And it's hard to have a crystal ball to see whether the stock market is right and things are on the path to recovery or whether we're going to have you know more shutdowns that will hurt the real economy uh, going into the winter period. How high are expected vols relative to historic, Nancy? It depends on the asset class. I mean, the volatility markets, I think one thing to demystify that is anything with an options market has a vol market, right? Options, vol, same thing. So volatility is a component that goes into the price of an option. Um, so you can have options on anything, you know, all asset classes. So most people, when they think of vol, they think of equity volatility, like the VIX index or stock options, but there are five asset classes total, there's, you know, the, the obviously the equity markets, but then you also have the credit markets, then you have all the FX, the foreign exchange markets, and there are, you know, a myriad of different pairs that you can have. Um, then you have the commodity markets. And finally, you have the rates market, which is what I specialize in with the IVOL ETF, that is uh, the interest rate markets are, you know, approximately five times bigger than the U.S. stock market. So it depends on the, the area. Obviously, equity and credit volatility, falls are still pretty elevated. If you look at a percentile, um, there are two types of volatility. There's realized volatility, which is what is uh, actually happening. And then there's implied volatility, which is where the market prices vol in the future, which obviously no one has a crystal ball. So, of course, implied volatility typically trades at a premium to realize volatility. Um, and so equity vol is pretty expensive. Credit vol is pretty expensive. Commodity vol generally uh, is pretty expensive. But interestingly, uh, interest rate volatility um, is actually trading near its you know, history of financial market lows. Um, there, uh, if you look at things like say the move index, which is, tries to, it's a proxy for interest rate vol, you can see that index started in 1988. And actually at the end of September, so this year, just like two months ago, it hit a lifetime history of financial market lows. So I think the one thing that you can take away from that is there's a lot of markets disagree. You know, the bond market is really saying, you know, the Fed is in control. There's not going to be any vol. We're not going to have inflation. Things are fine. Whereas the credit and the um, equity markets are still the people who are hedging in the options market are still concerned about valuations. Oh, it's interesting. So, okay, so relatively low interest rate balls, but high equity commodity balls. Uh, Gibson, I guess I'll ask you the same questions. Are, are stocks overvalued? Is there a disconnect? <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, as Nancy said, it is the, uh, the million dollar question uh, really presenting uh, markets right now. And I agree with her that equity markets are looking forward and they're anticipating a much more robust global economy than what we've experienced here over the last eight, nine months. You know, I, I remind investors that you know, markets are in many ways a function of supply and demand and flows. And when we look at what's happened with the intervention from central banks around the globe post the great financial crisis, and then we compare that to their intervention today, we're working in many ways in, in artificial markets that are being highly influenced by these central banks. And when I think about the equity market, I think it's very easy to jump to the conclusion that it's grossly overvalued. When you look at all the different metrics around the indices that we follow, many of them are in the top decile, if not in the first percentile on a 20, 30, 40 year basis. The question is why? 
And I really come back to this, this kind of view that the market's being manipulated, both the bond market and the equity market, um, kind of as a residual of the central banks, is part of the reason we're here. And the question is, how much longer will this, will this go on? Um, the bond market in particular is, and Nancy highlighted this in the low volatility, and we think about the low rates, the relatively flat curve, I mean, the 10-year treasury, you know, yielding inside of 1%, uh, you know, historical low. And that's clearly fueling investors seeking out returns in other markets, the equity market being a great beneficiary of it, but so are real estate markets and other markets. Um, the Fed, in their intervention away from keeping interest rates low, has engaged in, engaged in quantitative easing or putting money in the market by buying securities. And that's, again, forcing investors to do other things to garner returns, taking different risks. Um, I'll, I'll close with one last thing in this comment and that uh, I sent this note out to our team earlier in the week. You know, working in the financial markets back in the, in the 1990s, and we all remember kind of this steady increase in the equity markets through 1998, and then this parabolic jump in 1999 going into 2000, where the NASDAQ was up about 70%. Um, I think we all know how that ended in 2000, 2001. Um, we might be on the, on the cusp of another one of those parabolic or reflexive moves in the equity market. You're seeing this exuberant risk-taking. You're seeing you know, valuations through the roof. You're seeing companies IPOing and stocks trading up over 100% the next day. So kind of, it, it warrants some caution and it warrants, you know, paying close attention to what's happening. Thanks. Um, Ed, uh, same question. Are stocks overvalued? Is there a disconnect? Uh, so I would uh, just sort of take the academic line, which is that stocks are almost impossible to predict, as I'm sure Gant, uh, Gibson and Nancy know. Uh, so overvalued relative to what? Um, you know, the only predictor we have for the aggregate market in the long run, really, that has any substantial power is the uh, sort of trailing price earnings. And, um, you know, it has predictive power for a good reason. When valuations are high, it's because expected rates of return are low. When valuations are low, expected rates of return are high, which is exactly what asset price theories, theory says should occur. So are expected returns now low? Probably. Um, I mean, uh, as Gibson mentioned, the expected return on government bonds is quite low. So uh, that, you know, that interest rate is going to set the expected returns on everything else in the market. So when, you know, the 10 or 30 year rate goes down by 1%, the expected return on stocks should go down 1%. And uh, when expected returns are as low as they are, small changes in that interest rate have astronomical changes on valuations themselves. So... Uh, this is an important thing to remember that when interest rates are 6% per year, a 1% change doesn't matter that much for valuations. But when they're 1% per year, they really matter a lot. Uh, so should we expect the market to go down? No, I don't think so. But should we expect it to skyrocket? No, we should probably expect it to have a moderately worse than normal performance, which I think is how probably most investors are pricing it. Thanks. Uh, so I guess I'm going to move on to the next question. I also received a question from the Q&A, which I'm going to sort of embed into this next question. Um, what's the biggest risk to the economy and the stock market next year? And I guess, you know, sort of the, the potential uh, sort of suggested answers might be, um, well, low rates, or is it going to be improved demand because of the vaccine? Is it the shape of the yield curve? Uh, is, it, is it the valuation uh, of equities or is it inflated real assets? Sorry, so way too many things there. Rates, shape, equity valves, um, demand for the vaccine. Those sort of your choices. And I guess maybe we'll go, um, I guess we'll try the same order again. Nancy, what do you think? Well, I'd say a little bit of A, a little bit of B, a little bit of C and D. Like there are a lot of risks out there. And um, I think I think the one thing is everybody is expecting the Fed to be on hold and the Fed to be able to, the market has priced that in and rates where everybody's expecting low rates for a very long time. Um, but if you remember, like take say December, 2018, the rates market had priced in three hikes from the Fed in 2019. And then there was all this jawboning on Twitter about you know, Jay Powell, and uh, then the Fed actually cut rates three times in 2019. And there was no pandemic, there was no inflation, there was no big equity sell-off, there was really nothing going on. So I think the one thing I would caution investors is 
just because everybody thinks rates are going to be low for a long time and everybody is sort of, I'd say, complacent that they don't really think there's going to be inflation. I think inflation is the big risk because that would mean the Fed can't stay on hold forever. They might have to tighten monetary policy, which could derail uh, the rally that we've had in credit and equities and fuel a bond sell off, which is when, you know, that's when investors get slammed, especially if we have a stagflationary outcome. You know, like look at your daily lives today. Has anyone tried to buy a bicycle or a webcam or a PS5 or a, you know, new car or a used car? <laughs> you know, we are having a classic stagflationary movement because there's a shortage of certain things it's obviously not you know cruise lines and luxury goods and retailers but for other segments of the market you know, there is a shortage right now and the question is whether we're going to have growth that's going to come uh to those to those uh the the market generally to the real economy or whether we could have actually a stagflationary outcome which is you know to me i think the biggest the biggest risk to all investors is in stagflation that's when bonds and stocks sell off together. And that is the, you know, disaster nuclear node where, you know, the Fed can't keep stimulating with monetary policy and we have fiscal spending. We've already spent 14% of GDP on, on one month of helicopter money. We're gonna have more fiscal spending most likely uh, coming due. And if we actually have a stagflationary or inflationary surprise, I think that's just something people are not prepared for, um, their portfolios are not positioned for it. Everybody is, um, is expecting, you know, this, this bond rally and negative correlation between stocks and bonds to hold. And that's where people really get into trouble. So I would say it's all about diversification. Um, it's, there's not one, you know, safe haven thing that you can do, but I think it's just a really prudent time to be looking at what are the risks that nobody's expecting? And to Gibson's point, you know, the the rates market is saying everything is fine. There's no market volatility at all. Nobody's expecting inflation or stagflation. It's all it's all good, right? And that's what market volatility tells you. So I think it's a good time to be looking for, you know, ways to to own that, to have the asymmetry uh, in case in case it doesn't turn out the way the rates market is expecting it right now. Thanks. Uh, I guess Gibson, I'll ask you the same question. Maybe I'll narrow down your choices slightly. Uh, I mean, what do you think the biggest risk is? Is it, is it low rates? Is it demand? And sort of add maybe what Nancy said, you know, do you think it's the supply chain? Yeah, N Nancy raises so many great points around kind of the risk factors and the three that you've, uh, you've kind of given me to choose from. I would, I would probably mirror her comments. It's a, it's a function of all three. And if we think about where markets are today, there's a you know, with, you know, the last really four weeks, five weeks, when we had the announcement around the vaccine, um, we've seen kind of, the, again, a, a wave of risk taking and a wave of money coming back into the equity market. So, you know, the real risk in my eyes is some sort of complication with, you know, the vaccine, whether it be, you know, kind of a, a bad outcome from the inoculation or a complication in actually executing it and getting people um, vaccinated here, not just domestically, but globally. And I think that's the near-term risk. What, what's really fascinating and, and really seeing this over the last four weeks is we're watching correlations across different segments of the capital market start to move closer and closer to one to where small changes or small kind of risk factors that rear their ugly head will probably flow through to all markets. Um, and that's kind of how we're looking at it. And I mirror Nancy's comments that I, I'm very concerned and I should start by saying I'm very optimistic about growth. And when what I've read about the vaccine, what I've read about kind of the second derivative effects of this vaccine that we'll, we'll be working with for a while is really positive. And I think we are going to see an acceleration in global growth over the next you know, four to six quarters, which is going to be good. If the bond market starts to get in front of that growth and really starts to move and the central banks can't control particularly long rates, you know, we could enter an environment where that, you know, increase in interest rates or the change in inflation expectation becomes a bigger problem uh, for financial markets, particularly risk markets, credit and equity. And I'd say that's probably one of the, the things I'm more concerned about in the near term. Um, net net, though, um, there's a lot of positives in the marketplace today. 
Nancy used the word complacency. It's probably in every one of my conversations right now, particularly around interest rates. And I think investors have to step back and really, really evaluate where their highest conviction is and not get drawn into the positive energy of the equity markets or the positive energy of the bond market and think that, you know, these can't lose money. Everything only goes up. That's not the case. And we're reaching valuations where I think investors are more vulnerable today than they even were just three months ago. Thanks, Gibson. Um, Ed, I guess the same question. Uh, risk to the economy, rates or demand, uh, pandemic versus vaccine, or possibly supply chain? Yeah, I mean, I, I think my view would be it's it's that the long run sort of damage to the economy is is there. That's the biggest risk. So like Nancy mentioned in the first uh, response to the first question and Gibson echoed, I mean, the value of a stock today is the value of a, a long stream of cash flows going into the future. So if a company has one bad year due to a pandemic, it's sort of bad, but it's not that big a deal, uh, especially if interest rates are low. If a company has many bad years or goes out of business, that's a big problem. So I guess my main concern would be first that a vaccine uh, is late, but second that there's no uh, there's there's sort of no response once the vaccine comes out. So what we do need is once it is safe for the economy to be open again, for people to go back and spend the way that they were spending before, to go to restaurants, to you know go to a you know to travel. Um, and how is that going to happen? Well. One thing is that we have as big as a trillion dollar hole in state and local budgets, um, you know, over the next year to three years uh, that has to get plugged somehow. And states and localities don't really have the ability to do that on their own. They all have balanced budget requirements, which means uh, for the most part, they either have to raise taxes or cut spending to fund themselves. Uh, I think one of the biggest risks is that the federal government doesn't step in and ensure that there are no substantial demand downfalls from states and localities. What we don't want is sustained low demand after there's no reason for demand to be low. Uh, I think that hurts a lot of companies and uh, macro economies tend to be sort of self-fulfilling. When there's low demand, uh, there's low income and when there's low income, there's low demand. And so I would very much see as a risk that the federal government doesn't get its act together and support state and local governments and sort of make up for uh, income shortfalls that have nothing to do with the long-term viability of a business or the long-term viability of a person uh, in, as a worker for a business. So that would be my biggest risk is the government doesn't do what it's got to do to get the economy back on its feet as soon as it's able to do so. Uh, we got a question from the audience. Chuck Stearns asks, uh, sort of with the continuing political polarization in the US, do you feel that the US will diminish as a safe haven from foreign investments, uh, thus diminishing our markets. I guess we'll go backwards. Uh, Ed, what do you think? Do you think uh, polarization is going to affect foreign investment? You know, I, I guess that's a psychological question. I have no idea, but um, uh, nothing has really affected the dollar as a safe haven so far. Uh, it's a gigantic country. It's a country that central bank tends to be te uh, fairly well run. It's sort of the model of the world. Um, and you know, more than anything, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If everyone believes that the dollar is a safe haven, uh, then the dollar tends to be a safe haven, right? It tends to move in the opposite direction with the world economy, uh, which is good, it makes it a good hedge. So I think that tends to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, I'll tell you, I haven't been in the financial markets as long as Gibson or, or Nancy. I, have, I didn't really start following them until the mid nineties, um, but I remember when the euro came about and everyone thought the euro was going to supplant the dollar. And, and I was sort of at the tail end of everyone thinking the yen was going to supplant the dollar. Now everyone thinks it's the renminbi or Bitcoin. Uh, you know, I, I can't predict that sort of thing, but like I've been here before and I've heard this before. And honestly, my entire life that I've been paying attention to politics, it's been the most election in your uh, most important election in our lives. And it's been the most polarized time in our lives. So I, I, you know, we've been here before. I always told my students about the James Bond test. The first time a James Bond villain opens up a suitcase and it's full of euros instead of dollars. That's <laughs> when you know we're in trouble. But that was years ago and we seem fine. Uh, Gibson, same question. What do you think about the polarization? You think that's going to affect um, foreign investment? Uh, it, it, it may, but let's, let's remember polarization is part of our economic or our political system. It's just the way it is. It's, it's extreme today. There's no doubt about it. 
um, but it's just part of the system. And I think Ed brought up some you know, fantastic points in that over the last 30 years, we've been talking about the, you know, call it global, global reserve currency moving to different countries. And it just doesn't happen because of the size and scale and flexibility of our economy. Um, beginning of the year, as we went into this unconventional monetary policy and the fiscal stimulus, there was some real concern around the debasement of the dollar and the dollar was gonna be significantly weaker. It has happened um, on the margin. And I think we'll continue to see some volatility in, in the dollar over time. But remember a couple of things. Number one, there's 14 plus trillion dollars of negative yielding sovereign debt in the world today. Most of Europe, 10 years and in, is a negative yield. So investors are actually paying to own securities or financial institutions are paying for the privilege of owning those securities. Um, in that environment, having positive yields in our country and having positive yields in China will attract some capital. Um, we have not seen those flows coming as of late, and I think this is part of an adjustment process, but you know, money will find the currency where yield and return are available, and I think that will be a theme we'll be seeing in 2021 into 2022. Um, I, I think the, the bigger and probably more important question that isn't directly related to you know, political division, but just really comes down to credibility of policy and credibility of Kind of the ability to pay back debt or manage debt balances uh, that I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about at some point in this conversation. But you know, as long as most of the major developed economies are going through kind of the similar monetary policy and similar fiscal policy, we have a timeline where we're probably okay for a period of time. But the second one of the developed markets starts to take a left-hand turn and go a different way, you're going to see some of the flows change and some of the disruption and kind of some disruption brought into the capital markets. Thanks, Gibson. Nancy, what do you think? Do you think, uh, um, do you think uh, foreign investment's in trouble? Meaning it's in trouble, meaning don't- Sorry, let me, I'll, I'll repeat your question. Uh, so uh, let's see if I can find it again. Uh, the question was- It was about the dollar, right? Excuse me? It was about the dollar, right? Whether uh, foreign investors were going to stop buying U.S. dollar assets. Is that yeah, right? It was with the with continuing political polarization in the U.S. Do you feel that the U.S. will diminish as a safe haven for foreign investment, thus diminishing our markets? I mean, I think I have two two views. Like number one, you know, the dollar is you know a uh, a safe haven for many investors, but I think like all all uh, you know just like Rome, you know, at, at some point things will change and the U.S. will not be uh, the primary currency anymore. Um, I do, I don't know when that's going to happen, but I do think the demand for dollars is really high um, globally. And, uh, but that's where you kind of get into the, the dangerous spiral, right? Because if we have, you know, say, say like inflation, just to take that as an example, like say we do have inflation, say the Fed can't um, control the bond market and they need to hike rates when everybody's expecting them to stay flat for lower for longer, um, then we could have a weakening dollar as assets leave this country. And that actually then a weaker currency can actually trigger more inflation. So then you can get into the spiral effect. But, um, but it's really hard to say, like, I do think um, there is a need for investors to diversify. I do think, though, once uh, once the vaccine goes uh, is more broad stream, I, I don't know about you guys, but I'm I'm ready to get out of the house. You know, I'm like super bored about <laughs> being a uh, housebound, and I'm looking forward to traveling and getting out to restaurants and going back to like normal life. Um, so it's uh, you know I, I think kind of short term, it's sort of like a lot of pent up demand. But longer term, I guess we'll see. It, it really depends on, we rely on, you know, China and Japan are the two largest countries that own treasuries, right? And so we need to keep good relations with China. We need to have an administration who plays nice in the sandbox and thinks it's a global economy. And we don't want to go, you know, make enemies of people who own our debt. So I, I hope uh, the new administration uh, is uh, is cognizant of that, and we can have some real progress and and globalization kind of continuing because it's been sort of the opposite, where it's been everybody going in turn all these days. 
Great. Okay. So I'm getting lots of questions from the audience. A lot of them are sort of related and related to things that we were obviously going to talk about. So I'm going to try to incorporate as many different sort of points as I can in these next sort of two big questions. Uh, the first one is what should stimulus look like? And the second is how are we going to pay for it? And are you concerned about it? So let's start with the first question and I'll ask it in a little bit more sort of um, uh, detailed way. So what should the stimulus look like? Uh, to whom should it go? Uh, you know, we think about um, what the role is of uh, central bank unemployment, monetary policy, fiscal policy is what we're talking about here, uh, propping up unemployed workers. Uh, some workers' jobs are likely gone forever. So what should stimulus look like? Let's start with that. And then we'll focus on, you know, how we're going to pay for it and what the effects are second. So again, what do you think stimulus should look like uh, in, in the next year? And I guess maybe we'll, uh, maybe we'll start with Gibson this time. Yeah, it's great. You know, we've become so addicted to stimulus, whether it be monetary policy stimulus or fiscal stimulus that, you know, the market just begs for more. There, there's no doubt in my mind we need another round of stimulus to help small business, to help individuals who have been displaced or kind of disenfranchised due to COVID. Um, but I'm not necessarily sure the scale needs to be as big as initially proposed. If you recall, a few months ago, we were talking about one and a half to two trillion dollars on the high end being the additional stimulus that could be approved by Congress. Um, on the other side of the aisle, there was talk of five hundred billion dollars. I don't know the exact number, uh, but I do believe that additional stimulus is needed to keep the economy going, get the economy geared. As Ed described earlier, you have a self-fulfilling nature when demand is working that it, the economy feeds on itself. The, the one issue that I really take with um, some of the fiscal stimulus is that uh, we've worked in a, in a very entitlement minded economic environment where it's just a handout and the handout does naturally work through the economy. But I would hope that Congress would step back and think not just about stimulus, but about policy. If we can change some of the policies and some of kind of the incentives around the economy and use the stimulus to really fuel those policy changes, I think we're in a much better uh, kind of position or a much better situation in terms of sustainable economic growth. Um, we need to get people back to work. So we need, you know, policy change then stimulus that fuels that. We need infrastructure spending. We need, you know, uh, spending and policy changes that fuel small businesses that ultimately hire people. We need to improve incentives around education. I mean, things that if we think about our culture, our country, things that really fuel long term growth, not just short term kind of sugar high stimulus growth that isn't sustainable. Uh, Ed, I guess I'll ask you the same question. What do you think stimulus should look like? Who should it go to? And, you know, the remind everybody of the very briefly, quickly of the poll results. Uh, you guys see that? So these were sort of the poll results from people. And uh, yeah, curious what you think stimulus should look like. Yeah, so I think that the the key is like once everything can reopen, there are going to be areas of the economy that have a lot of slack and areas that don't. And by slack, I just mean areas where the sort of pre-existing capacity is here and the uh, sort of usage of that capacity without any government intervention is here. And the nice thing about areas with slack is if you stimulate demand in those areas, it just increases the amount of activity taking place uh, without really having any pressure on prices. If you have areas like bicycles that Nancy was mentioning, where there's not a lot of slack, where we're already producing as many bicycles as the industry can really take care of, well, you simulate demand for bicycles, you just drive up the price of bicycles. You don't actually get any new academic, or sorry, economic activity going on. And so I think where are you gonna have slack? As I mentioned before, the most obvious ones are areas where the demander of the uh, good or service is state and local governments. Who hires teachers? Well, private schools a little bit, but mostly public schools. Who hires police officers and, and um, you know, the fire people, et cetera? It's mostly state and local governments. And so I think if you can stimulate demand in those sectors, you increase the amount of activity taking place to back where it was pre-pandemic. Uh, you don't go past that point. You want to get it just up to that point and then stop. Um, so I think if we, if we look at the so-called stimulus bill uh, in the CARES Act, you know, we had $1,200 checks to, to families that made no sense at all, makes absolutely no sense. The vast majority of people getting those checks were gonna do nothing but sit on it. And worst case scenario, the economy opens back up, there's pent up demand that Nancy was mentioning and we all turn around and compete over the same resources uh, and there's just no extra capacity for those resources. And that just drives up prices 
without actually driving any economic activity at all. What you really want to do is give it to people who are going to sort of demand the things that would have been demanded pre-pandemic that weren't demanded during the pandemic because they were shut down. The people who are going to demand restaurant services, people who are going to demand, you know, movie services, things like this. So to my mind, it's state and local governments. It's people who are going to spend the money, but who will spend the money on the right things, which is the, the areas that are coming back from being shut down during the, the shutdown. So slackers are anti-inflation. Okay, good. Uh, Nancy, what do you think? What do you think? Uh, where do you think the stimulus should go? Well, I have a lot of opinions about a lot of things, but this is one subject that I am just grateful I'm not a policymaker because it's it's so difficult to figure out where do you put the stimulus? Like, who do you give it to? To to Gibson's point, you know, you don't want to encourage people to you know, sit at home playing video games on their couch and just collecting a check to not go back to work. And at the same time, you don't want to put the money with uh, businesses who don't need it and you want it to be spent well. So it's definitely a challenge. I'm just grateful that I am a, not a politician and not a policymaker because I think it's kind of mission impossible to not, you know, create the incentives that make it to the real economy but not create other, you know, second derivative effects that could potentially be negative long term. So it's 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 a super challenging topic and not something I'm fortunately uh, in a position to control or have any opinion on. Okay, uh, so I guess we'll talk about the other side of this, which is. Uh, let's see. So I'm going to sort of read into a question here. Um, monetary policy, sorry, mon money supply is up a ton. ton. Uh, thank you, Brian. M1 up 45, M2 up 25. There's a three trillion dollar increase in the Fed balance sheet. Um, any sort of stimulus is going to increase is going to increase the federal debt, likely. Uh, although we could get liquidity from the Fed as well. Uh, what do you think the effects will be on this this stimulus? Uh, how concerned are you about? Uh, about the federal debt. Maybe we can also talk about the Fed balance sheet uh, if you want to talk about those two things sort of separately. Um, and I guess maybe we'll start with Nancy this time. It's something I do have more opinions about and do feel like I have a more of an expertise. And we are, you know, majorly in debt, you know, super, super debt. And it's not just the United States. It's the whole world is swimming on this sea of debt. You know, it's, it's incredibly uh, challenging. The debt per GDP has just exploded. And that goes back to my, you know, original thing about, I do think inflation is really an undervalued asset because the way to solve, you know, as a country, a big debt problem is, you know, have your currency depreciate and inflate it away. So I do think it's a super problem. People have been talking about it for years, but you know, we are basically shifting the burden, you know, I'm a mother, I have, I have kids, you know, it's on the next generation, and all of this fiscal spending, and QE infinity that's happening around the world, we're just taking, you know, it, it is a sugar high right now for financial assets, we need to get it to the real economy, which has, you know, still TBD if it's going to happen, and then we not need to not burden, you know, future generations with our spending. So it's an incredibly difficult thing. Um, there's way too much debt, but it's sort of mission impossible without inflation. How are you going to get rid of it? Uh, I guess, um, Ed, I'll ask you the same question. What do you think, uh, you know, what do you think the effects of a stimulus might be on both the Fed balance sheet and on the, uh, the federal debt? Uh, well, the effect on the federal debt, obviously, is to increase it. But uh, I, Sorry, that's I thought, not what I meant. I meant what would the effect yeah, I, of, the, I, I, of an increase in the federal debt? I, I think I'm probably a lot more sanguine than most people who are regularly involved in financial markets. Um, I, you know, since World War II, which is really once the international financial system and sort of economics has has come to work the, the way it works. Um, you know, we've never seen, for example, a debt spiral for countries that borrow in their own currencies. So think about developed countries like the United States that, you know, it borrows in the dollar. This idea that you run up a lot of debt and then you, you sort of get into a spiral and eventually the whole thing collapses, you know, it's never happened. We have countries like Japan that owe, you know, 200% of GDP um, that are still borrowing for incredibly low rates. 
Um, you know, it's, I think we had this, we had the 1970s, which were the only real supply side recessions in history. And you, although you might count the pandemic as one and you had this massive inflation, but then you have the rest of time uh, when inflation just has not been an issue in any developed country. And so it's, I think there's this specter hanging over us from the seventies, but we don't, I don't think economists know a huge amount about exactly what caused that and what would cause it to happen again. If you had a huge negative shock to the supply of a country, of course, it's going to cause inflation. There's less stuff to go around. People drive up, you know, there's demand for that stuff. Prices get driven up. But I, I don't know, absent the supply shock, what really causes that? I'm not saying, you know, I'm not trying to say that I do know. I don't know. I have no idea. I just think we all know less than we say. Um, and I also take issue with, with Nancy's view, which is a common view of, about the burden to future generations. I mean, we're mostly borrowing from ourselves. And so it's true that taxpayers have to pay interest on that debt, but they're paying interest to taxpayers. And interestingly, a lot of the federal government, uh, is not including social security, is funded by wealthier individuals. Well, those are also the people buying the bonds. And so we're sort of taking their money in taxes and we're giving it back in bond payments. Um, so I, you know, I think a, a, an economy is not like a household in the sense that the more you owe, the worse it is for you because we owe the money to ourselves ultimately. So I guess I'm just a lot more sanguine than, than most people. You don't see this as, uh, as a coming tragedy. I do not. I also don't worry about the, the Fed balance sheet much. I mean, they've exchanged cash, which pays 0% for bonds that pay effectively 0%. Uh, you know, they, they can undo that. It's not that hard. So I, I, I guess I don't worry a lot about QE. Uh, in 2008, when QE first happened, I know a lot of uh, commentators were very worried about it, and most economists like Bernanke uh, were not. Uh, I do think that Bernanke was vindicated in that one. Um, obviously, people still are concerned about the specter of inflation, but we never saw it happening, uh, which was the, the prediction of the Bernankes of the world. So, uh, All right, Gibson, what do you think about uh, about um Fed action and uh, and increased stimulus. What do you think that might do to the to the economy and the markets? You know, it, it, you know Ed, uh, listening to your comments, you sound a little bit like a, a modern monetary theory supporter, uh, which is really in vogue right now in terms of uh, kind of this new policy of governments can borrow infinitely as long as inflation is in check. And if we look at our experience over the last 30, 40 years, that pretty much has been the case. Um, you know, and I, I want to be cautious in that we don't want to be too complacent around debt levels. We definitely want to be conscious of the level, the absolute level of debt in an economy as a ratio to GDP. But, you know, we've been worried about debt since I entered the financial markets back in 1991. We've been calling for the death spiral and for inflation and dollar debasement and the end of the world as we know it. What's very interesting, if you think back to you know, the early years of Bill Clinton's presidency, there was a point in time where you know, we were concerned there wasn't going to be any government debt outstanding and we weren't sure how we were gonna price corporate bonds. And so I, I remind investors that you can't be complacent about debt. That's never a problem until it's a problem, right? Think about companies, it becomes a problem when they can't refinance the debt or they can't make the principal payments on it. Government's a little different. They have the ability to print currency and, and issue debt and payment for that, which obviously has an impact on the currency. But I, I actually remind our investors all the time that growth is a very powerful thing. And I think what Ed highlighted earlier about kind of the, you know, the virtuous circle of economic growth as things start to move, it produces um, a lot of optionality in terms of reducing debt and or taking care of those shortfalls that have been financed through difficult economic times. So I, I don't want to be complacent. I think it's, it's an issue that we're going to deal with going forward. Um, but I actually think if we get economic growth going, we're going to have the ability to delever. And as it relates to the corporate or the, the Federal Reserve's balance sheet, um, you know, really all it is is a transfer. It's a transfer of debt for cash from you know, the Fed to the Treasury. And, and as Ed said, that's an easily executable transaction that um, could take place. So no complacency around it. These are issues. Debt to GDP ratios are high. We need growth. The Fed knows we need growth. 
The Fed also knows they need to keep long-term interest rates contained so we can finance our deficits at the federal level. Um, and I think we're going to look back three, four years from now and realize a lot of our concerns about the upper over levered nature of the, you know, the developed economies, um, they're going to be more in check three, four or five years from now. Great, thanks. So, so sorry, sorry, go ahead. I want to be clear. I, I'm not an MMT guy <laughs> at all. So I, let, let me just clarify. I honestly, I, I don't think macroeconomists know all that much. Like history hasn't been that long. We haven't had that many recessions. There's just not that much good data to know if we do X, what happens to Y. And so I, I think, you know, I would much rather not have 200% jet debt to GDP or even 100%. I, you know, I wish that up until 2019, we had been reducing the debt burden. Um, all I mean is sort of right now we have sort of abstract, unclear costs in the future to increasing the debt burden versus sort of clear first order benefits. Uh, to it. I think in 2019 and 2018, it was the exact opposite. There was an unclear cost, but also a fairly clear benefit to not, you know, when you have a full economy with no slack, if the government is spending less, then everyone else is going to spend more. Like there, there's a crowding out effect there. So I, I really wish we had been spending less prior to, to this pandemic occurring. So I, I'm not an MMT guy. I apologize if it came off that way. Uh, I, just, I wanted to give you a little bit of a hard time out there. It's a, it's a you know, it's a market, fo market focus right now on MMT and Stephanie Kelton's book is, is getting a lot of traction. And I think people who were raised in the financial markets over the last 30, 40, 50 years are scratching their head a little bit because the, the fears that we've lived through haven't played out yet. And you know, we have to remember also, I mean, if you think about kind of an optimal capital structure for a company and you think about a debt service or kind of a borrowing cost, you know, companies are levered right now too, and they're levered for the right reason. Interest rates are very, very low and it's very inexpensive capital. And you can play that same argument into the federal level where the, the, the burden of that debt is not very high from an interest expense, you know, um, kind of inter interest expense area. But if we go into an environment where the economy starts to improve, we start to see things starting to move and then the interest rate markets or the bond markets start to adjust, Obviously, governments have a bigger issue to deal with in terms of refinancing that debt at higher rates. Great. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Can I give you one more thing? Please. Oh, no. Uh, I can't share my screen. Okay. Well, uh, I will send it to you, Dave, and you can share it if you see fit. Okay. Can you send it through the chat? Uh, yeah, I'll put it in the chat. Okay. Uh, so one of the things I would... I'm Go sorry. ahead, Nancy, please. I just had a like a kind of like light bulb moment that goes off. It's it's so funny because as we're talking about interest rates being so low and companies borrowing, like, you know, close your eyes, like it looks just like before the financial crisis when we had, you know, individual investors borrowing for property. So I think the one thing it's not, I think the the Fed and the Treasury, they can print money forever, right? That that is like the reality of how the financial, it might not be right, but they can, right? So whether you're MMT person or not, but the problem that I see is corporates are incredibly levered because money is cheap and there's really, you know, there's so much money, especially in the private credit market. Private credit has become this like magic unicorn for allocators where they're like, oh, it has no, you know, market volatility and it's still, it's still a company, right? It's still a corporation. There's still, you know, revenues and expenses and there's no magic thing about a private company versus a public company. So I do think we have a massive corporate debt problem. And it mostly, in my opinion, exists in the private credit markets because there's so much capital that's being, you know, it's going out of government bonds because of the low yield and the low potential return and flooding into private credit. And so I think it's it's one of those things that it's not, debt's not a problem until it is, but so many companies are so incredibly levered and you have everybody, you know, everybody's fighting for growth right now, right? So the debt to actual, you know, profits is incredibly low because everybody is, you know, expecting it to be a growthy environment. So I think the the problem to me is going to be on the corporate side if you actually see the economy not be able to recover and these credit spreads widen and you know the fed was very successful by 
just hinting at buying corporate bonds and everything calmed down. But I think there is a debt problem in corporates uh, generally, and it's not just public corporates. It's really on the private side, in my opinion. Yeah, Nancy, one of the one of the interesting things on that front, if I can just chime in, and, and we think about personal uh, kind of leverage versus corporate leverage is that corporations with operating margins, um, as they grow, the operating margins give them the ability to delever. So that operating leverage inside of a corporate kind of structure allows for the leverage, whereas the leverage on a personal basis, when you have incomes flat or stagnant for three, four, five years where wages aren't going higher, overall compensation's not going higher, you can't service the debt. And so when I, we look at corporations today on the, on the credit side, there's an enormous amount of operating leverage in many sectors that is also being fueled by high financial leverage. And so if we think about these companies being really geared and we do get economic growth, the outcome could be significant, really significant and very, very positive. I think that's one of the, the really big themes that is underappreciated in the financial markets today that operating leverage has imp improved. Companies have cut costs, they've improved productivity, and they are sitting on significant financial leverage. So growth can really fuel a major deleveraging uh, trade over the next three, four or five years if growth does actually uh, come, to, come to fruition. So it's a great point, really great point. Let me just share this link very briefly and I'll let Ed sort of lead us through it. Ed, do you have any? Oh, this is just going back. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, you need to scroll down. This is just, a, it's, a, it's an interesting forum run by uh, the Chicago Booth Schools IGM, the Initiative on Global Markets. It's a, a poll that they regularly run uh, with a group of uh, academic experts from across a number of universities and academic fields. Well, where the last sort of questions that are of particular popular interest at the time uh, as a survey. Uh, so what's useful about it is it does give you a pretty good view of uh, what academic economists think about things that are in the news sort of in terms of economics. So this first question is countries that borrow in their own currency should not worry about government deficits because they can always create money to finance their debt, always being the key word that, that I think people are responding to. Uh, as you can see, the, the field of, of economics does not actually agree with that view. So uh, it is a, I think it's viewed as a, a field of economics or a view in, in economics that has gotten very popular. Uh, and I think it has among a certain segment, but not among, um, not among academic experts at any rate. Uh, and Dave, there is a, a second question, but it tells basically the same story. So, so no need to extend that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so one of the things I was attempting to do was sort of combine questions and also attribute them to the people who asked them. I've done a lousy job, I think, with the second part. So I apologize for that. Uh, in addition, sort of, you know, people are asking questions that overlap and relate and sort of slice into the same pie. So I apologize if I didn't get to your specific question, but hopefully we covered things that were able to, um, uh, to, to, to address sort of the meat of what you were asking. I guess the next sort of question is, um, what happens to the economy if uh, if there is no stimulus uh, package? If there is no agreement on stimulus that's reached, what's going to happen? Well, I'll, I'll, oh, I'll chime let in. Me, let me uh, choose somebody. Yeah. To, I apologize. I'm waiting for somebody to raise their hand. Gibson, go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll start, and then uh, I'll let Ed and Nancy chime in. You know, I, I think you know from a from an economic standpoint we are on the right track towards fueling better economic growth between the, the you know the unconventional monetary policy we've seen the first round of stimulus and this is again a global phenomenon there is a massive amount of liquidity in the system you mentioned m2 earlier you know the, the real issue with m2 growth is that you've got velocity that's negative if not you know completely dead and that will change as the economy starts to improve in my opinion but you know, I, this next round of stimulus is, is kind of the insurance policy, in my opinion, just to make sure that we address some of these sectors in the economy that are, you know, really experiencing tough times. It addresses a elevated unemployment rate. Again, my hope is that we change policy that fuels employment versus just, you know, giving handouts to or entitlements to, to, to displaced uh, workers in the economy and really want to get people back to work. But I think it actually just adds more fuel to the fire and puts the odds of a sustainable economic recovery um, a little bit higher than it is right now. But 
I think even with the amount of liquidity in the system right now, the odds of a sustainable economic recovery are much greater, uh, I think, than most believe. Uh, One thing I know before you turn it over, I would, I would say that markets, oh, sorry. No, I'm sorry, I, 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 I stopped and then came back in, but I don't think markets will in the short term be very receptive of no stimulus. And I think the odds of no stimulus are very, very low. Let me add to this because um, one of the questions was, do you think money supply alone is what is explaining these increased values? Or do you think, and I think you just answered this question, I'm just using this as an opportunity to get another viewer question in, uh, th that it is money supply alone. You really think that they're expecting demand from the stimulus? Well, actually in many ways, you can kind of tie this back to flows. And you think back to the, the start of the COVID crisis, a lot of money moved out of the equity markets and moved out of the bond markets into money markets based on fear. We were going into the Great Depression again. If you remember back in March, it was it was dire times. That money, 4.2 to 4.5 trillion, still sits in money markets. And if we think about the execution of quantitative easing, where the Fed is taking securities out of the marketplace, that creates a cash balance. And some of that cash balance goes back into equities or bonds. Some of it goes back into money markets. And so it's not, I mean, we can tie that into the money supply, but in reality, this is a flows situation where if you're taking securities out and that money's coming back, it has to find a way back into seeking return. And one of the big supporting factors for financial markets over the next 12 months could be the ultimate reallocation of some of that money market capital back into risk assets, whether it be equities, corporate bonds, or even just bonds in general. So that's my thought. I think Nancy's probably got some great thoughts on this in terms of uh, you know being fully engaged in the financial markets. Yeah, Nancy, I'm going to rephrase the question slightly. Uh, I'm going to say that: Do you think um, current valuations are a function of money supply alone, or do you think that stimulus, uh, expected stimulus, is propping up these values? And what happens if there is no stimulus? Well, clearly the markets are pricing in a stimulus. So if we get no stimulus, that would be a bit of a disaster. Um, I do think the good thing is that both sides of the table, so to speak, want stimulus. I mean, I think that's not really a question that we're going to get stimulus. I think the question is how much, when, and how are we going to spend it, right? That's more the policy question, like where is it going to go? But clearly not getting stimulus would be a huge disappointment because markets have priced that in already. Um, going back to financial markets, I think you have a major uh, dislocation between asset classes. So if you look at say credit and equities, those markets have been very forward looking and believing that, you know, growth is coming, you know, we have this huge coiled spring that it's everything is going to be great. And you can see that in the values, you know, stock prices have risen, equity indices are, you know, near all time highs, um, even with some of the laggard sectors like, you know, uh, leisure goods and, and cruise lines and airlines and other things still kind of being down in energy. But you have and credit markets, credit spreads are near all time tights, meaning, you know, the market is really euphoric in the credit markets. But if you look at other markets like the rates market, for instance, we are nowhere near our pre-pandemic levels. You know, it's the Fed is saying uh, we're going to have, you know, two percent is a soft inflation target. Now we're going to be really focused on inflation. And if you look at the uh, the ten year, you know, the ten year is still below one percent. So I think it would actually be very healthy if we can get a steeper yield curve in the markets because that is. That is a mechanism of getting money from the banking system to Main Street, right? It's all about lending money. And with credit spreads so tight, you're not really being compensated for extending loans, but you need a steeper yield curve to really incentivize uh, investors to be lending money to, uh, to get that money from banking to the real economy. And so if you look at you know, the 10-year yield, I think higher yields would actually be more positive because that would encourage, you know, markets uh, to, to get more loans, to get more money to the real economy. And so I think we're really waiting to see if we can have the rates market kind of agree with equities and credit. Equities and credit are saying party on, things are good, we're getting back to work, you know, economy is going to be fine. But the bond market, the government bond market, specifically the 10-year, 
is still saying, you know, danger, 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 right? The 10 year is not in a healthy position. Um, if you look at 2013, for instance, I like to pick that because it was when we were coming out of the European debt crisis. Remember that started with Greece and everybody was very worried that this was another 08. But in 2013, if you looked at um, policy rates from the Fed, we're very near where they are now, near the zero bound. So there was no you know, policy. We were near the zero bound in interest rates, but the yield curve was 250 basis points. And that was just normal. There wasn't, you know, nobody was worried about inflation. Nobody was worried about, you know, the debt bubble. It was just a normal, normal market. And so I do think a steeper yield curve will really be the next thing that will be uh, what's going to happen if the recovery is really uh, real because the 10 year yield should be a lot higher than where it is now if the Fed's targeting, you know, 2% plus, you know, maybe higher. Why would you ever lock up your money for 10 years? Currently, the US yield curve, um, if you look at the swap curve, it's 70 basis points. You know, think about what the rate market is pricing in. It's saying, you know, everybody believes the Fed's going to be on hold. So the two year point is the same, you know, almost as policy rates. Why would you ever get, lock your money up for 10 years and only get paid 70 basis points if you think we're going into the super growth environment? So I think the one thing I'd, I'd really highlight is the 10 year government bond and the credit and equity markets are saying two wildly different things. And it's TBD about who's going to be right. But I do think we should expect much higher yields if this recovery is real. Uh, yeah, so I think net interest margin is, uh, you know, yield curve and uh, credit curve steepness, and those are all both super flat. And so that is affecting, yeah, the profitability from lending. So that's, uh, that's very interesting. I guess, Ed, I'm going to ask you the same thing. Do you think, uh, you know, again, I'm combining a couple of viewer questions here. Do you think stock prices are popped up, be uh, propped up because of uh, money supply and low rates? Or do you think it's um, growth from stimulus? What do you think? Uh, what, what do you think? Uh I mean, again, they, they could be high because the, the numerator or, is high or the denominator is low. So either, you know, they expect high cash flows or they expect low rates to continue, right? I mean, if you have a low 10-year or 30-year rate, that's going to make the value of stocks high because it means future cash flows are worth more today uh, than they otherwise would be. Or put another way that's maybe less academic-y, uh, what else are you going to do with your money for 30 years if you can only earn 1.5%? Um, so... So yeah, sure. I think you know low rates are consistent with that. Uh, there was the the question of uh, of how sort of the money supply is affecting this stuff. Uh, I will just mention I'm I'm not sure exactly what people are referring to with money supply. So there there had been a comment in the Q and A about M two, uh, which is one particular version of the money supply which bumped up because of uh, because of stimulus, right? It, it because a bunch of money was taken from Treasury. And given to individuals. So M2 is that the currency in circulation, checking and savings balances and money markets basically. And yeah, if you give people a bunch of money, they're going to put it in the bank and put it in money markets and that's M2. Um, and I, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, Gibson mentioned before that, that velocity is way down, which is true. Uh, and if velocity were to bounce back to where it was prior to the recession and M2 stayed the same, then that would, that would, I mean, in the short run, that would be a good thing, probably, but that could eventually be inflationary in the long run. Um, the the Fed's behavior, though, is a, a different. It's having a different effect. It's having an effect on something called the monetary base, uh, which is currency plus banks uh, deposits with the Fed. And so I'll just sort of show that with you guys. You can see uh, these big upswings in uh, reserves of depository institutions occur whenever there's QE. So when there's QE, the Fed is giving a bunch of cash to banks and banks are giving a bunch of bonds. In the old days, it was treasuries, but with QA, it's other, uh, QE, it's other stuff now uh, to the Fed. But what these big upswings are in total reserves of banks is basically the cash is just sitting there because there's nothing to do with it, right? There's no, there's no good return you can earn on this cash. And so it's just sitting there. So I think any effect that, that this has on asset prices, it has sort of through the, the, the channel of low interest rates. It's not like the money that the Fed is giving to these banks is, is going anywhere. It's going into the banks, 
into their accounts at the Fed, and it just sits. It's not getting into the economy. Um, and I think that's, it, you know, in the old days, prior to 2008, when the Fed, you know, did open market operations with the banks, the money got into the economy, right? If interest rates are 5% and the Fed gives you cash, which yields zero and takes away a bond paying 5%, you turn around and you lend that money out. And that's, that's how the Fed stimulates the economy. But now it doesn't work that way because rates are too low. And so the Fed gives them cash, takes a bond and the cash just sits there. And so the Fed just right now doesn't have any powder. Now, if interest rates did come up off zero, especially long rates, then that powder is sitting there sort of ready to go. Um, so what's going to drive that? Is it going to be demand for, for borrowing? Yeah. So I think this, this comes to what Nancy was saying with, with long rates. I, I agree with her completely that the economy doing well means long rates will go up. That, they, the two positively correlate. Uh, I guess I, I don't agree that, that the way to stimulate the economy is to increase long rates because, you know, demand for everything slopes down. And so if you just raise long rates, all else equal, the demand for loans goes down. I mean, I'm not going to redevelop my house. You know, I'm planning to refurbish my house next year. And if I can do it at 3%, they'll do it. And if it's 5%, I won't. And I think that's a pretty normal uh, change in behavior for anyone making a long run investment or a, a purchase of a durable. Um, so I think long rates are indicative of economic success, not a, a cause of it. Ed, yeah, Ed, I would, I would strongly encourage you not to renovate your house, right? I mean, it's the worst, worst thing you can possibly do. Um, you know, one, one of the things that you touched on, which I think is, is really critical for investors to understand, we, we've written a lot about this and we talk a lot about it, is this, this captured capital that sits in financials right now. If you think about the large you know, financial institutions, the large banks um, in the economy here, they have been in a high regulatory environment post the great financial crisis, and they are you know, forced to hold high levels of reserves to protect against another great financial crisis. And I do think that you know, some deregulation in the financial sector will release some of this captured capital. It's been even more amplified as part of the COVID crisis because banks had to reserve against expected defaults and expected delinquencies and, and other issues associated with the, the shutting down of the global economy. And so when we look at financials, and I think the equity market has this right, the equity market's looking forward and saying, if we have sustainable growth, if we have a better outlook, some of this captured capital inside of these financial institutions is going to be released. Some of it will go to shareholder friendly activities, hopefully. Some of it will go to lending. Some of it will go to other areas of the economy that will hopefully fuel more sustainable growth. And I think this captured capital theme is really, really important. It's really significant. And I'm not necessarily sure the market truly understands it right now. Well, thanks, Nancy. Do you have any sort of um, parting, uh, parting comments for sort of past one? And uh, I, I'd say this actually, I apologize, Nancy. Um, there were some very specific questions that were asked in the chat room. Uh, we didn't quite get to some of those having to do with the effects of PPP and uh, some mortgage rate stuff. And I apologize for not getting to some of the very specific things. I think we covered most of the broad topic questions. And so I'll just ask, yeah, for some, some final thoughts. Uh, Nancy, go ahead. Well, Going back to my, you know, comment about not being a policymaker, I do think there is one way that the Fed can very easily help stimulate all the cash that is, you know, sitting in the banking system and getting it out to the real economy. And I do think that would be a reverse Operation Twist. Um, they implemented Operation Twist uh, during the Greek and European crisis, which is what really killed inflation expectations. Um, it was just normal, you know, there was no worry about inflation, but it was just normal, even with policy rates near the zero bound to have, you know, a two, two and a half percent normal upward sloping yield curve. Um, what, you know, the whole way banks work is they borrow short term and lend long term. So I do think a way to get credit out into the businesses is actually having a steeper curve. And I do think it's very actually easy to do because they just need to change what they're buying and buy, you know, that you want the funding markets to be loosey goosey, right? You want that grease on the wheel to be, you want the repo market super functioning. You want people to know that they can borrow overnight. You want funding really, really easy, right? And to do that, you know, you actually, I think, want to have uh, more purchases in the front end 
and less purchases in the back end to steepen the curve. And that will get all that cash that's sitting there out into the market. And that will also get, get it to the real economy. So I do think a reverse twist would be, I'm not a policymaker, but if I was, I would be doing a reverse twist, really telling the market about it because I don't think um, higher long-term rates would be bad for credit or equities. I think it would just help get more money uh, to be lent. Even during uh, the depths of March and April, the Fed was coming out and saying, we don't lend money, right? That's not their job is to be a creditor. Um, but the, you need to have creditors be incentivized to get the money out there. So that would be my, uh, it's very unconventional thinking, but I do think, you know, the whole operation twist was actually pulling from the 1960s. It was experimental monetary policy in the 1960s. And I think just like probably most things in the 60s, maybe, maybe uh, you know, some architecture is pretty good if you like uh, that, that style, <laughs> but most things should be left there and not, uh, not brought back into today's times. Uh, Ed, you want to um, make some final comments? Let's get that money to states and localities and let's get it there fast. Good. That was one of the questions that was asked that I, we didn't quite get to is how important is it to get it to states and locals? And so glad you mentioned that. Uh, Gibson? Yeah, you know, as a as a fixed income investor, um, we we tend to uh, be a little more on the on the dark side. We tend to be fairly negative, and we can see what's wrong with everything. We we tend to live in fear, and you know, I frequently say, I you know, we see dead people. I mean, we can see the worst in everything. And when I look at the economic environment, I think about the stimulus in the system. I think about you know the unconventional monetary policy. I'm I'm actually really excited about the prospects for economic growth, both domestically and globally. And I think the artificial markets we're working in today are really just that. And um, as a fixed income investor, clearly the conclusion then is, are you worried about interest rates? And the answer is yes. I think it's one of the biggest risk factors we face as investors over the next two, three years. Um, and I hope, I really hope that my views on a sustainable economic growth outlook play out uh, because if they don't, if we continue in an environment of very low, uh, low growth, very low inflation, uh, the debt problem we were talking about earlier uh, will really take center stage and we'll have some issues that we'll have to deal with that are far greater than what we just came through in terms of COVID. So I'm optimistic, but very, very cautious. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, Nancy Davis of Quadratic Capital Management, Gibson Smith of Smith Capital Investors, and Ed Van Wessop uh, of uh, the Lead School. Uh, thank you so much for, for your time today and your insights. Uh, one last thing is that uh, we're going to have a poll launched in a second regarding sort of your opinion of this, uh, this, this, uh, this session. Uh, there it is. And so thank you so much. Uh, I, uh, I appreciate your attendance and thank you to our panelists. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. And thank you to you as well, Gibson and Nancy. Yeah, Ed, Nancy, great seeing you. Great being with you. Dave, always, always fun. Thanks, guys. Great. Thank you.